We're back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard Eskow, RJ Eskow, and our next guest has written a rather uh, unexpected book, or at least few of us expected it. Uh, Gennady Stolyarov II is a transhumanist philosopher and the author of a children's book <clears throat> entitled Death is Wrong. He's also an actuary, science fiction novelist, philosophical essayist, poet, amateur, amateur mathematician, and composer. Um, he's also worked a lot in the insurance field, as did I in a previous life, so we have that in common. Um, Gennady, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Richard. I am very pleased to be able to talk to you today. Did I pronounce your name correctly, first of all? It's Gennady for American audiences. For Russian audiences, it's Gennady. So I was closer to the Russian, but, but I'll call you Gennady, so, so uh, everybody's comfortable here. So listen, uh, you have... Uh, written a book that's gotten a lot of attention, both positive and negative, and I, and, uh, I wanted to talk to you about it, explore the ideas in it. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about Death is Wrong. Sure. Death is Wrong is an illustrated children's book on the feasibility and desirability of indefinite human lifespans, lifespans that don't have a fixed upper limit. The book is aimed largely for children ages eight and up. I think some precocious younger children would also find the book to be very interesting and beneficial and motivating. It's also a good primer on indefinite life extension and the recent scientific advances with regard to it for teenagers and adults who are seeking a concise introduction to the idea. Now, a lot of people will say uh, their first reaction will be that this idea of indefinite life extension, which means that barring any sort of drastic, that we would achieve some sort of scientific state of knowledge where uh, barring any accident or, or, or event from the outside, people could live indefinitely long lifespans. Many people will say this is a, a, a very fringe idea, and yet Google, among other organizations, uh, perhaps Google's the most conspicuous, has invested in it uh, and, and given its backing to it. Uh, I would say, you're free to disagree, probably the, the standard scientific and medical community has not embraced it as a practical idea at this point, but there's, it's certainly being explored. And um, why is this a good thing? Why is this something that children or, or anybody else should aspire to? It's a good thing because life is good and the life of every single individual who hasn't committed extraordinary amounts of harm is precious. It's a whole internal universe of thoughts, sensations, feelings, aspirations, memories, and to have it all be snuffed out, to have all of that be irreplaceably gone, uh, not just to others, but also to oneself from the standpoint of one's own experience, to me, is a great moral travesty. Historically, of course, our technological means to combat it have been very limited, but that may change within the next several decades. You mentioned Google's Calico initiative, which is very encouraging. Craig Venter has started a new company called Human Longevity, which is also going to be making forays into that field. And then we have Dr. Aubrey de Grey and his seven-pronged SENS, Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, which uh, essentially have identified the seven types of damage that uh, essentially constitute bodily deterioration and senescence. If we can reverse each one of these through periodic treatments, then we're good to go for an indefinite lifespan. And that's a good thing because we preserve all of this richness that each individual has to offer to the world. Well, but but now let me give at least part of a counter-argument. One is that even a radical extension of lifespan, should that become 
possible and there you know there will be objections you've heard them all about population and and uh, doing this in an economically just way but, but without even going into those for a moment at least um extending the lifespan is not the same as eliminating death so one of the criticisms that uh, that your book has gotten for example is is slate wrote that representing death as wrong gives it greater power especially when people do die i mean i think even in an indefinite lifespan scenario people will die right i mean even if we were able to eliminate the natural causes of death there would be accidents there might, tragically might be wars or terrorism or meteor strikes or whatever so so is it right to tell children that death itself is wrong and should be eliminated? I would say that while reversing senescence is not in itself a panacea for all death, I do think it will alter the way people treat other perils in terms of their risk aversion, to use a concept that's commonly utilized in the insurance world. So if a person has more to lose, if a person has, say, 500 potential years of life to lose from an accident or from an act of crime, that person is going to be a lot more careful and a lot more interested in averting that peril. For instance, I think indefinitely long-lived individuals will be a lot more interested in riding in autonomous vehicles where the possibility of human error causing an accident is greatly reduced, if not eliminated. I think they'll also have a longer time horizon. They'll want to avert larger scale crises and disasters that could make life very unpleasant and short otherwise, such as wars, uh, pollution, even uh, longer term natural uh, disasters, ice ages, for instance, or a meteor strike. I think people who have hundreds of years to look forward to or thousands of years to look forward to potentially are going to be a lot more attentive to these kinds of risks. And that means through the progress of science and technology, we'll have a better world in those respects as well. Last question then. Uh, why kids? Why a kid's book? Why not just write an adult book making these arguments, making this case? Uh, what made you decide to gear this, this uh, rather unusual argument by most standards towards young people? It's because young people are today really only exposed to rationalizations for death, either religious or secular. When they first encounter the existence of death, they're met with consolations or excuses. They're told that death is natural, or uh, you go to heaven after you die, so you really live on or it's not going to come uh, for a long time for most kids, so put it out of your mind. And I wanted to introduce them to a different perspective. It's surely not the only perspective they'll be exposed to, but I want them to consider that it may be possible to defeat the primary cause of death uh, within existing human lifespans. And if so, that's a really worthwhile effort. I want these kids to go into fields where they could make a difference. I hope this book inspires a lot of kids to become scientists, engineers, medical doctors, or philosophers and activists, however they're inclined, so that they can make a difference. And at the same time, they could improve their lives and contribute to the world in a really good way. Well, you've given us something to think about. Um, Genedy Stoliaro of the Second, author of Death, Death is Wrong, a children's book on, uh, on indefinite life extension. Thanks so much for being with us. It's a pleasure, Richard. I appreciate you having me on this program. Uh, you bet. And that's it. We will be back with James Hughes, uh, who is the director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, uh, right after this message. I'm R.J. Eskow, and this is... The Zero Hour.